Praise God. How's everybody doing this morning? Now go ahead and give yourself a hand. In fact, indulge me a little bit here. Hold your hand up like this. Reach around and give yourselves a big pat on the back. Because the pastor's away, it's raining, and the vol's lost. So it would have been really easy to rationalize sleeping in this morning. So you guys are the faithful and stalwart. And Minister James is happy not to have to preach to a bunch of empty seats. Amen? Okay, you can be seated. And thank you, Minister Erica, for those kind words. I'll do my best to live up to them. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to first have a prayer for our pastors. Amen? Father, we lift up our wonderful shepherds, Pastor Larry and Miss Diane Keith, to you right now as they take this much-needed and much-deserved vacation. Lord, we pray for special mercies, Lord, every day they're gone, and Lord, just give them a good refreshing time of, of blessings there. And Lord, there is no distance in the spirit world, so we pray that, they can, that they'll be able to, to feel the prayers of their church family back home. And Lord, let them know we love them and we miss them, but that we're happy they're getting to have this time off. And Lord, we pray that you'd bring them safely back to us with lots of good stories about how you've ministered to them and how, they, and how you were with them while they were there. And Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I get started this morning, I'd like to dedicate this message to the Lord, of course, but also to a man who is a real spiritual father to me and who introduced me to a lot of the things I'm going to be sharing with you, Pastor Roscoe Oxendine. I'm sure that the message is called, before I get started, the message is called The Power of Pentecost. And I'm sure that most of us would agree this is a message that's had a very profound effect on both of our, on all of our lives. And you may come from a long line of spirit-filled believers. If you do, that's great. Or you may be the first one in your family. And if you are, that's a special thing, too. That means you're a pioneer. But uh, don't ever let anyone put you down for believing in these truths. Does anyone ever ask you if you handle snakes? <laughs> I don't hear that as often as I used to, but that's a stereotype that comes up from time to time. And if you're visiting this morning, you can rest easy. We don't do that here. But... <laughs> A few months ago, I read a great book called Salvation on Sand Mountain. Has anyone ever read that? It was written by a reporter who spent some time covering the snake handling, a snake handling church. I think it was in South Carolina. And one of the things he uh, describes was a man who was handling a rattlesnake, and the snake bit him. And the man stuck his finger in the snake's mouth and yanked its fangs out. Now, that's some hardcore Pentecostal right there. <laughs> Has anyone ever called you a holy roller? Now, well, I have, um, I've been running with this crowd for a long time, and I've only encountered one man who you could genuinely call a bona fide holy roller. I won't use his name. We'll just call him Brother H. And if you talk to Brother H, he was a really shy, introverted man, but everyone in the church knew when it became Brother H's time to testify, get out of the way. He'd, he'd start speaking in his normal voice. He'd gradually get louder and louder, and he'd be, he'd be uh, doing his arms in a windmill motion, and before long, he would take off, do a couple of laps up and down the aisles, and then hit the floor and do a holy break dance. Now, was that excessive? Maybe a little, but I'll tell you this. Everyone there would be blessed and inspired by seeing a man just abandon himself in worship to God that way. And let's be honest. When we want to criticize someone else for going too far in God, it's because deep down we know there's areas where we're not, we're not going far enough. Amen? And Brother H was and is a very sincere man whose passion for God was so strong, you couldn't be helped but be moved by that. And let's talk for a minute about the word passion. A Danish philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard said that the greatest threat to Christianity was not so much blatant sin as it was a lack of passion. And even people who may disagree with us or criticize us will acknowledge that we as full gospel believers have brought some much-needed passion back to the body of Christ. Amen? We've gone from being the backwoods laughing stocks to being the fastest growing religious movement in the world. Some of you might be familiar with George Barna. He's a Christian pollster who tracks trends within the church. And a 2008 report by the Barna Group states that in America, a slight majority, 51% of all born again Christians, identifies themselves as either Pentecostal or charismatic. That includes 46% of Protestants and, interestingly, 36% of Catholics. And certainly we can thank God for that, but that does have some drawbacks attached to it as well. And one example of that, well, several examples actually, are the high-profile ministry scandals we've seen in recent decades. Now, some of you may disagree with me on this, but I think most of these ministers started off as good men with genuine calls of God on their lives. Jimmy Swaggart, in the early days of his ministry, he actually turned down a big-money contract to go into country music. And at the time, he and his family were living out of the car eating bologna sandwiches. He had no, no 
idea, the links that his ministry would one day go to, but he turned down that contract because he didn't want to forsake God's calling on his life. But like the others, he was thrust into a spotlight that he wasn't ready to handle. And it's been said that a lot of great men of God have been brought down by the three G's, gold, girls, and glory. And obviously that's something we have to watch out for. But after that lengthier than the normal introduction, we'll get into the word. You know I'd get to that eventually. And as usual, unless I tell you otherwise, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. The Amplified Bible words it this way, And Jesus answered them, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified and exalted. I assure you, most solemnly tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but lives by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. How many of you will agree with me that Jesus didn't waste words? If he's, if he's going to use the analogy of a seed germinating to illustrate what he was going to do on the cross, there would need to be a logical progression of that. Amen? With that in mind, let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instruction through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he has promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taking up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Okay, here we're seeing Jesus parting words to his disciples. He died, he'd risen from the dead, and is about to go to heaven. He'd given them the great commission to go into all the world to preach the gospel. But when we put it with this passage, we see he's emphasizing, don't do it yet. Wait till the Holy Spirit has empowered you to do it. You can't do it on your own. They tried it, but they wound up denying him and running running away in fear. He knew that they would not be in any condition to carry on his work in their own strength. They They needed supernatural empowerment to do it. We see this come to fruition in chapter two, a very familiar passage to most of us. And I'll start reading in verse one. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and sat on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. At the time there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were, continue, they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, and I hope I pronounce all these right. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converse to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, And we hear all these people speaking in our own languages the wonderful things that God has done. This was a harvest festival known as Shavuot or Pentecost, which means weeks. It was set up to be seven weeks after the beginning of Passover. If you'd like to study the background more, you can look in Leviticus 23, 15, and 16, and Deuteronomy 16, 9, and 10. But Pentecost was one of three pilgrim festivals in which the Jews would make a journey to Jerusalem, the other two being Passover itself and the Feast of Tabernacles. And by timing it this way, the Holy Spirit saw to it that there be an international assembly there to see what was about to happen. Pentecost is, and don't miss this, 
where, the, where we see that kernel of wheat that fell to the ground and died come to fruition. Jesus had planted the seed with his death, and this is the beginning of the harvest right here. It's generally recognized as being the beginning of the new covenant and the birthday of the church. Now, believers of our persuasion have a special connection with this because we believed what, the, what these believers experienced on this day is available to all Christians today. Amen? We believe in an experience we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's an empowering, as Jesus said, to be his witnesses in the earth. You may, you may recall call back in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 22, that Jesus had breathed on his disciples and told them to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, personally, I like the word Holy Spirit better than Holy Ghost. God's not a spook. Now, the word, Greek word pneuma is the same, so if you say Holy Ghost, I'm not going to fuss at you about it, but that's just my personal preference. But anyway, this word breathe is very interesting. This particular Greek word is only seen one of the time in the whole Bible, and that's in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's the word used when God breathed the breath of life into man. So just like God breathed the breath of life into man when he created him, he's breathing the breath of new life into these believers when he cre- has recreated them. Amen? Let's look, let's look back at verse 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages or other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And the Pentecostal distinction is this. We believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is accompanied by an initial physical sign of speaking in other tongues. Now, when this comes up, there's understandably a couple of questions that people like to ask, and I'll, I'll address those now. The first one is, don't I get the Holy Spirit when I get saved? Absolutely you do. When you're first born again, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, but it doesn't stop there. And if we think that's the, all of the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get, we're really limiting his work in our lives, wouldn't you say? If you take a drink of water, the water is in you. But if you go down and dive into the swimming pool, you're in the water. So for lack of a better term, we get a drink of the Spirit when we're saved. But when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we're totally immersed into him. And we experience him in ways we never have before. Powerful experience. Another question is, doesn't the Bible say that not all will speak in tongues? Of course, the quote is from 1 Corinthians 12.30 when the Apostle Paul asked, hypothetically, do all speak in tongues? We'll look at those verses in a few minutes, but speaking in tongues is a very multifaceted jewel. There are different manifestations of it. Will all Christians speak in tongues as a public ministry gift the way this verse in 1 Corinthians described? No. But as we'll see, there are other forms of it that are absolutely available to all believers. And it all begins with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, is there a scripture that specifically says that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll speak in tongues? No. Admittedly, that's a case we have to base on inference. But turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians 13.1. This is the first time I'm coming to visit you, and as the scriptures say, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Here we see one of the key principles of biblical interpretation. Any doctrine must be established on a minimum of two scripture references. And keep them in context. Don't take Judas went out and hung himself and put it with go and do thou likewise. But seriously, using the principle as our guide when we study this subject, the inference we see is overwhelming. The book of Acts records six specific times when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, and each time it either says they spoke in tongues or it strongly implies they did. For example, it, we just read Acts 2, two uh, verses 1 through 4, and as we stated earlier, of the 120 people there who received the baptism, every one of them without exception spoke in tongues, inclu- and that included, interestingly, Mary, the mother of Jesus. But next, let's turn to Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people in Samaria had accepted God's message, they they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit had been given to these apostles, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he explained, claims, so that when I lay hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking that God's gift can be bought. There's a lot you could say right there, but that's another message. You have no part in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. 
For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed, that these terrible things you said won't happen to me. Here the apostles received the news that the gospel is spreading into Samaria. Upon hearing this, they sent Peter and John to pray for them so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. Notice how they saw that as being an immediate need. But while they are ministering to them, a sorcerer named Simon sees this happen, and he offers them money that, he could do, that he'd be able to do it too. And, and as we saw, Peter sharply rebuked him, telling he has no part or lot in this matter. And although this account does not specifically mention tongues, there's, it's important to notice two things. In verse 18, Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was being given, so there must have been some sort of visible evidence of that. Verse 20 when Peter tells Simon that he has no part or lot in this matter, this is interesting. The word matter in the Greek can also be translated utterance. So Simon had no part in the utterance that he saw. Keeping these things in mind, as well as comparing other scriptures with it, I believe it's perfectly safe that, to say that the evidence that Simon saw was he saw these believers speak in tongues, wouldn't you? Now let's look at Acts 9, verses 17 and 18. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Okay, this event is right after Saul or Paul's dramatic encounter with God on the road to Damascus. God sent a, name, a man named Ananias so that Paul, who'd been blinded during that encounter, might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Although this particular passage also doesn't mention that Paul spoke in tongues, we know he did because he later wrote 1 Corinthians fourteen eighteen. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than y'all. Now to Acts 10, verses 44 through 46. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to his message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard of them speaking in tongues and praising God. This is from the account of Cornelius and his family who were the first... Gentile or non-Jewish people to ever become Christians. Cornelius had been seeking God, who sends an angel to tell him to seek out the apostle Peter, who at the same time was told by the Holy Spirit that Cornelius was looking for him. It's amazing how God works that way. But Peter obediently goes and visits Cornelius and shares the gospel with him and his family. And while Peter is preaching to them, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they speak in tongues. The Jewish believers were astonished at this because the Gentile family had received the Holy Spirit just like they had. But notice when they, when they witnessed it, the evidence that they recognized that they'd been filled with the Spirit was that they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Next, let's look at Acts 19. I'll begin reading with verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance of sin. But John himself told the people to believe in one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. This is pretty self-explanatory. These believers that Paul encountered had never, never even heard of the Holy Spirit. But notice that since they hadn't been filled with the Spirit, it, they were seen as lacking something very important. And Paul gave them further instructions, baptizes them with water, and lays hands on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues and prophesy. Now, it's important to remember that while speaking to, in tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism, it's certainly not the only evidence. Sometimes, especially in big crusades when they've got a lot of, pe a lot of people to minister to, it's like, okay, say yabba dabba do. Okay, now you're filled with the Spirit. Next. And I'm being a little silly there, but you get the point. Yeah, tongues are an important part, um, tongues are an important part of it. But if you're truly spirit-filled, your life will bear it out. In the book of 1 Corinthians, we see a church that had lots of tongue-talking in it, but Paul had to scold them very sharply for being carnal. Corinth was a very immoral city. It's been called the red light district in the ancient world. Temple prostitution and things like that were rampant, and unfortunately, the church there was not exempt from that. They, they, were, um, they had people who were getting drunk at the communion services, and they were tolerating a man having, having an affair with his stepmother. So the tongues in themselves don't necessarily mean that the people there are, are leading holy lives. I mean, anyone can come to church and go through the motions, but if they're living like the devil the rest of the week, obviously that's a sign of a deeper problem, amen?
Now, some of you may be asking, what's this speaking in tongues business all about? Why would I even want to do that? Glad you asked. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll read verses 14 and 15, and this time I'm reading from the King James. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. Okay, here we see the biblical precedent for what we sometimes call our prayer language. That's when we talk to God in a way that surpasses our human understanding. And praying in tongues has been humorously compared to Popeye eating a can of spinach. Just like when he eats that spinach, it gives him an instant boost of strength. So when we pray in the Spirit, it builds up our spiritual lives. In the same chapter, go back to to verse 1, still in the King James. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men for edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So here you see in verse 4 that praying in other tongues will edify you, and to edify you means to build you up, to strengthen you, to recharge you. But backing up to verse 2, we see that as we pray in this manner, we're tapping into God's supernatural mysteries. And I want us to really focus on this word mystery. The Greek word is mysterion, and the definition is in pretty strong meat. Listen to this. Strong's Greek lexicon describes it as a hidden purpose or counsel, secrets confided only to the initiated. Listen to how Vine's Expository Dictionary defines it. That which, being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension, can be made known only by divine revelation and is made known to, to those only who are illuminated by a spirit. Friends, do you get what the Holy Spirit is saying to us here? Obviously, there are many parts of the spiritual realm that are beyond our simple human understanding. I mean, we've got eight pounds of gray matter to tap into all the mysteries of the creator of the universe. Paul prays in Galatians, for example, that we would know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge. But God is giving us a way here to know what is otherwise unknowable. Next, let's turn to to the book of Romans, chapter 8. I want us to look at one of the most beloved, yet one of the most misquoted promises in the entire Bible. Look at verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who, are, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, praise God, this is a promise that's brought hope and comfort to countless people through the centuries. But most of the time, it, off, it gets quoted completely out of context. Let's look up a couple of verses, starting in verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that cannot, words cannot express. Now, a respected Greek scholar named P.C. Nelson points out that this is best defined as groaning which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. Now on to verse 27. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he, the Spirit intercedes for the saints in in accordance with God's will. As you think about that, keep in mind how Hebrews tells us that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. And according to these other verses, the Holy Spirit is interceding to the Father for us as well. We have a prayer meeting with all three members of the Godhead on our behalf. And these verses are showing us how we can get in on it. This is how all things will work together for our good. This is how we can partake of the mysteries that are unavailable to the uninitiated. This is how we can know the otherwise unknowable. Friends, you need this more than you could ever realize. And this, I'm giving you one of the most important things you'll ever learn as a Christian. You need to pray in other tongues every day of your life. And if you don't, then you'll have an opportunity to get it this morning. Amen. And in addition to this, it's the doorway where we can enter the other realms of God's revelation, which we know is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful that in today's church there is a a renewed interest in that. I don't know if you're familiar with Donald G. He was a great Pentecostal scholar uh, of the earlier part of the 20th century. If you've never read his books, I'd recommend them to you. But he said it well. In the realm of Christian experience, there is one whole continent of truth largely, largely unexplored, and that is the Holy Spirit. In spite of much that has been written, there is dissatisfaction with many doctrines about the Spirit of God. Christians cannot remain satisfied with vague aspirations and pious platitudes, for there is a rich field of spiritual territory that ought not to remain unexplored and left uncertain. It should be boldly surveyed and accurately charted so Christians may know what is truly theirs in Christ. And that's what we're doing this morning. Amen? With that in mind, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll start reading in verse 1 again with the King James. 
Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, at one time, that seems to be one thing that the church was the most ignorant of, but thank God that's changing, amen? Some of you, some of you may notice that the word gifts is italicized in some of your translations. That's because it's not in the original Greek text. It was put there by the translators for clarification. It would be better worded concerning spiritual things or things pertaining to the Spirit. But as we read further, several, verse, several verses that, uh, in this passage do use the Greek word charismata, so which, does it mean, which does mean gift. So that is an appropriate word to use. Now verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. Notice there are diversities of gifts. When we normally think of nine spiritual gifts discussed here, but uh, it's better understood that these are nine subcategories of these diverse gifts. Okay, back to verse 5. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are differences of operations, but the same God who worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And manifest is, manifestation of the Spirit comes from the Greek word phanerosis, which means a shining forth of the Spirit. For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another word, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, Notice here that gifts is plural. That itself shows there are more than nine gifts. To another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as, as he will. For as the body is one and has many members, so all the members of the body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ." Now, there are some people who try to categorize the gifts just in human terms, like, well, gift of healing, that's doctors. The gift of tongues is people who translate into the language. And, you know, those are noble callings, but that doesn't fit the context of this passage, that these uh, gifts are described as supernatural, direct impartations from the Spirit of God. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I don't think any of you think that, but I, I wanted to include that. I want to give you a brief explanation of each of the gifts listed here. Obviously, time prohibits us from going uh, into, the, into much depth with each one, but e any of them could be a sermon in themselves. But I hope this will provoke you to further study. And if you, if you, even if you don't normally take notes, I would encourage you to. We'll start off with the word of wisdom. Now, Proverbs tells us that wisdom is the principal thing, but as important as human wisdom is, that's not what this verse is talking about. This gift is when God gives supernatural wisdom into what to do in given situations. Remember when Jesus was a baby and Mary and Joseph had to, uh, hide, them, had to hide him in Egypt because Herod was looking to kill him. And eventually Joseph uh, gets a, has a dream where, in which an angel instructs him that it's safe to go back. Well, that's, the word of wisdom works very similar to that. Another example would be in Acts 6 when the early church received special guidance on how to take care of widows that they felt were being neglected. Friends, God is practical, and he'll give us wisdom if we'll listen to him. Amen? That next, we have the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is very similar in some ways to the word of wisdom. It's God re revealing secret knowledge about a particular situation. Colossians 2.3 tells us that all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden with the Lord. And this gift gives us a special look at that. A biblical example would be when Jesus was talking at the woman, to the woman at the well, and he received special insight into her life that she hadn't shared with him about shared with him but that encounter changed her life one really touching modern example i heard was a minister uh, got a word that there was a young lady in the congregation who had been hurt because her boyfriend didn't give her a valentine's day card and sure enough there was a teenage girl that came forward and got ministry for that god loves us and there's no need that we have in our lives that he, he doesn't care about Next is the gift of faith, and this is one we have to be very careful how we define. All Christians have to have faith. The Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we're saved by grace through faith, so without faith you can't even be a Christian to start with. And Hebrews eleven six tells us without faith we can't please God. So this kind of faith is a non-negotiable part of our lives. But the gift of faith is a different thing. It's a special anointing of exceptionally strong and unshakable faith that God imparts in a specific situation for a specific purpose. In, Elijah, I mean, in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see Elijah's showdown with the prophets of Baal. Now, that took faith if anything ever did. But the very next chapter, Elijah is fleeing for his life and praying to God to die. So 
apparently the faith that sustained him against those false prophets was a special anointing that God had given him for that, and it lifted afterwards. And after that, Elijah had to learn to trust God day by day, like we all do. Next, we have the gifts of healing. Now, of the ministry of Jesus we have recorded in the Gospels, roughly two-thirds of it involved healing. And all Christians can and should minister to the sick. One of Jesus' parting comments in Mark 16 was that believers would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And the book of James also gives uh, the elders of the church a special mandate to pray and minister to the sick, and we'll do that a little bit later on too. But again, there are people who do have a special anointing to minister in this way. Now, there are also understandings on how the gifts of healing operate. Some people say, well, you believe in healing, go empty out the hospitals. But it's not quite that simple. Even Jesus, Jesus himself couldn't just operate in this gift at will. In Mark 6, 5, it, it, we are told about a situation where he could do no mighty works because of the people's unbelief. It doesn't say he wouldn't. It said he couldn't. And so there, does, there has to be faith on the, recipients, uh, on the part of the recipient as well. Now, this also does not in any way preclude the use of doctors and medical science. Thank God for that. God used a physician named Luke to write two books of the New Testament. And a lot of people think he was one of the early medical missionaries. So God's provided a number of ways to get healing to his people. But at the same time, that doesn't downplay the importance of the supernatural healing either. It's been said, where you go to church can mean the difference between life and death. If you go to a church that doesn't teach the importance of, of believing God for healing, there's going to be a time you need it, and you won't be able to get it. You have to be in a place that feeds your faith in this area. Amen. Next is the gift of working of miracles. And in some ways, it's similar to the, the gifts of healing, but it's broader in scope. Not all miracles are healings, and not all healings are miracles. A person gets a cold, they go to bed, eat their chicken soup, and in a few days they get better. You know, that is... Not what you would call a miracle healing, but it's no less the gift of God. It's God simply working through the healing properties he put in our bodies when he created them. But when God acts in a way that overrides or supersedes natural law, that's when you get into the definition of a miracle. An airplane can fly because the law of lift overrides the law of gravity. And that's the key to understanding how miracles work. God created natural law for his own purpose, and he can supersede it as he wills. Some examples would be when Jesus walked on water or when he stilled the storm. Amen? Prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14.3 tells us the gift of prophecy is speaking under special revelation from God, words of encouragement and comfort. It can but doesn't always deal with future events. But of all the gifts, this is probably one of the most dangerous if people misuse it, and there are people who do. Let's look at a few of the things the gift of prophecy is not. The gift of prophecy is not a Christianized version of the 1-900-go-to-hell psychic hotlines you used to see on late-night TV. And there are websites when you can go get a quote-unquote prophetic word. Don't pay any attention to that. The gift of prophecy is not adding to the Bible. The canon of Scripture is closed, and anyone claiming they're giving you revelation on par with the Bible, someone like Joseph Smith, needs to be rejected outright as a false prophet. Prophecies, personal prophecies, are not sources of doctrine. That, that got Benny Hinn in trouble a few years ago. You might remember that when he said that the Godhead had nine members. And to his credit, he did repudiate that. So I'm not bashing Benny Hinn, but you see the danger that can, that can lead to. Operating in the gift of prophecy does not mean that a person operates in the ministry office of a prophet. The fivefold ministry, including the prophet, are recorded in Ephesians 4.11, and those are special gifts of leadership that are, di are by divine calling only. But 1 Corinthians 14.31 says that all believers can prophesy under very strict guidelines. In 1 Corinthians 14.29, it says that prophecies are to be judged. Now, that, that's one of the problems I have with, like, the websites trying to give out the prophetic words. The gift of prophecy, according to this, is to be used in a church setting under strict accountability of the church leadership. Have you ever encountered a parking lot prophet? Someone who just randomly comes up to you and says, hey, I've got a word from the Lord for you. Now, thankfully, I've never seen that happen here, and I don't believe I ever would. But if someone ever does that, tell them immediately, let's go find the pastor or a trusted Christian leader to, bring it, to come in and listen to this and judge it. If a person's not willing to subject themselves to that, do not give them the time of day. Those kind of people are dangerous, and lives have been devastated as a result. I heard of one preacher that I thought handled it really well. A lady came up and said, do you have a word from God for me? He just opened his Bible and said, yeah, read yours. <laughs> Discerning of spirits. This gift deals with the ability to see supernaturally into the spirit realm. 
you notice when Jesus ministered to people, he had supernatural insight into what was going on. If a, sick, if a sickness was caused by a demon, he knew to cast it out. If there was some other factor involved, he always knew, and he would minister accordingly. That's the gift of discernment in action. Remember in Acts 16, there was a girl following the disciples around, shouting out, these men are the servants of the Most High God, then they've come to tell us how to be saved. Well, what the girl was saying was absolutely true. But as it turned out, she was a demon-possessed fortune teller. Paul saw that, and he cast that thing out of her. And I believe he got that revelation through the gift of discernment. The Bible tells us in the last days there will be an increase in demonic activity, false miracles, lying signs of wonders, things like that. So the gift of discernment is more important now than it ever was. I'll combine the last two gifts because they operate together. Speaking in tongues in this setting is a supernatural utterance in a language unknown to the speaker. 1 Corinthians 14.5 said that when combined with the gift of interpretation, it's equal to prophecy, so it has to be subject to the same guidelines as prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14.22 further tells us that these kind of tongues are assigned to unbelievers. Now, I mentioned earlier how there are different manifestations of tongues. The gift of tongues here is a different thing than the prayer language we talked about earlier. While the gift of tongues is assigned to unbelievers, some of the instances in Acts we read where people got their prayer language, there weren't any unbelievers there. The, the gift of tongues has to be interpreted, but 1 Corinthians 14, 28 says it's not necessary to interpret your prayer language. I mean, God may give you an interpretation of it, and if he does, that's great, but that's not necessary. And while not everyone will be used to the ministry, mystery gift of tongues, ministry gift of tongues, I'm sorry, we saw earlier how the prayer language is something that all Christians can and should have. So you have a brief overview of the gifts there, and every one of them is available to us as spirit-filled believers. Three times in the book of 1 Corinthians, we're told to covet, or as the Greek says, pursue with passion the gifts. Friends, that's a command, not an option. It's not something we should take lightly. People sometimes ask, what is the greatest gift or the most important? And the answer to that is simple, whichever one is needed at the time. If there's a setting where you need supernatural wisdom, then the word of wisdom will be the greatest gift for you. If you need a healing or a miracle, those gifts will be the most important in that setting. It, It varies depending on what's going on. So it's easy to wonder that since this is so taught so prominently in the Bible, why hasn't the entire church world embraced it? And there are more spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christians in the world than ever before, but still there is some resistance to it in the denominational world. Now, many of us, myself included, come from denominational backgrounds, and denominations can be both a help and a hindrance in our walk with God. On one hand, denominations give a structure, and that's good. God is a God of order. And since different denominations emphasize different aspects of God's character, we can help check and balance each other that way. But even at their best, denominations are man-made. And when the denomination, rather than the Word of God, becomes our source of truth, then obviously that's a problem. Amen? I heard about a man that belonged to a certain denomination I won't mention, but he, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and his le- church leadership wasn't too happy about it. And one man held up a copy of their denominational manual and says, what you're doing is not taught in this book. Well, the man just holds up his Bible and said, but it's taught in this book. What more can you really add to that? (laughs) Now, one common objection is that the gifts I've told you about are no longer available today. There are different theories on why that is, but the usual explanation is they ceased with the completion of the Bible. Let's look at the passages they based that on, 1 Corinthians 13. I'll begin with verse 8 in the King James. Charity or love never fails. But where there will be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will be past, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understand as a child, I taught as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now this passage does refer to a time when prophecy, tongues, and things like that will cease. But when will that happen? According to verse 10, it will be when that which is perfect has come. Now the Bible is perfect, but nowhere in this, these passages is the Bible mentioned. Verse 12 describes the day when we will see face to face, not face to page. This is plainly referring to the return of Christ. When he returns, we'll see everything, everything clearly. We'll, our human limitations will be removed, and we won't need the gifts anymore. But until then, 1 Corinthians one seven tells us we're not to lack any spiritual gift, charismata, same Greek word, as we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So until that day, the supernatural gifts of the Spirit are to be a regular part of our lives. Amen.
So why hasn't it always been that way? Let's go back to the Old Testament in the book of Judges. This is the call of Gideon, uh, chapter 6, beginning with verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiazar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And why have all the, where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Now, there are a lot of sermons you could preach out of this passage, but the point I want to make is the Bible itself acknowledges there will be times when the supernatural power of God will be more prominent than others. And when we don't see it as much as we'd like to, we're told to go with the strength that we have. God has always given us strength, even though it may be a different form than we might we might think about it. But even then, it doesn't mean the power of God is not there. Church history itself bears that out. There have been times when the gifts have been strangely, have seemed to be strangely absent from the life of the church. But even then, there's there are lots of ancient church documents that record miraculous healings, prophecies, and tongues. But even still, the decline, I believe, has been largely due to the fact that the church stopped obeying the command to pursue the gifts we talked about earlier. But that changed in the 20th century with the, with the outbreak of the Pentecostal movement. Many of you are familiar with that great Azusa Street revival where God brought new light on these long-neglected truths. And over the decades, that took on different forms, like we saw the great post-war healing revival. And then in 1968, I believe it was, when an Episcopal clergyman named Dennis Bennett received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that introduced it largely to the denominational world. That was a very major event. Never forget this. Truth knows no denominational boundaries. No brother or sister in Christ is our enemy. Jack Hayford said, Genuine spiritual fullness is bridge building. To be fully Pentecostal means being open to the fullness and breadth of the church. If you have a commitment to building the kingdom of God, you have to be committed to the church beyond the sector you're in. And I'm thankful we've got a pastor who who epitomizes that. Amen. But whatever your background may be, embracing the spirit-filled life will not do away with any of the truth you may have learned in your denominational church. Thank God for the truth you already know. But there's more where that came from, amen? But still, there are people who just think this stuff is weird. (laughs) Even that, though, is not unusual. If you'll remember on the day of Pentecost, they thought the people there were drunk. But just just because something may be new or unusual to us doesn't necessarily mean it's not God. We should not see people get slain in the spirit, you know, where they fall over into the power of God. People say, what if they're faking it? Well, if they are, if they won't lay down on the floor, I don't guess they're really hurting anything. You know, you may get tired sometimes and decide you want to lay down on the floor. (laughs) Admittedly, though, there are more serious concerns because sometimes it does happen in a manipulative way. Have you ever been in a prayer line and if you didn't fall down, the person praying for you would give you a little push or a smack? (laughs) Once, I was in a meeting with a fairly no, well-known preacher. If I used his name, a lot of you would know him. But he had, a prayer, he had a prayer line at the end of the service, and I went down front, and I was the first one in the line. And he comes over and stands to my left, and he, we just our eyes met for a minute. But out of the corner of my eye, I could see he was wearing a large ring on his right hand. And just all of a sudden, he yells, in the name of Jesus, and he turned around and smacked me with that ring. And I went down all right, but that wasn't exactly a spiritual experience. But... <laughs> <laughs> but just because there are people who exploit it like that doesn't mean that it's not real, that, that doesn't really happen. We've got several biblical examples of people falling under the power of God. John eighteen six, when Jesus identified himself to the mob that came to arrest him, the impact of that knocked him to the ground. Acts 9, 4, when Saul of Tarsus had that encounter with God on Damascus Road we mentioned earlier, the brilliance of the vision knocked him over. Revelation 117, Jesus appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, and John falls to his feet as one dead. So it's a perfectly biblical experience. But also, just because there may be excess and abuse in something, genuinely, doesn't mean that God's not at work in spite of that. Earlier, I mentioned many of the problems in the Corinthian church. That's a prime example. But in spite of that, Paul never said the spiritual gifts they were experiencing were not real. God moves through flawed flesh and blood human beings, and obviously he doesn't always approve of the way we respond to it, but he chooses to use us in spite of ourselves. Remember the Toronto Blessing that was a big rage about 15 years ago? Um, If you don't, it was a revival where um, 
it featured things like holy laughter and people making animal sounds. And admittedly, all the information I had for about it was second or third hand. I'd never actually seen it, so I was, I didn't want to form an opinion really either way. But uh, I was watching a uh, panel discussion of it on a Christian television program, and one of the people participating, I thought, had a good point. He said it could be that the Holy Spirit is moving on people who haven't been trained in how to operate the, in the gifts. And when they experience that present, they don't know how to respond, so they they may just do a gut reaction of some kind, and that, that's certainly a possibility. But as always, be teachable, and don't, but don't be gullible. We can avoid a lot of these problems by simply make, keeping our focus in the right place. And in closing, let's turn back to Acts chapter 2. I'll start reading in verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about it. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. He doesn't say they're not drunk. He just says they're not drunk the way you think they are. This pastor said they just drink from a different spigot. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. People say there's no humor in the Bible. That's some pretty funny stuff right there. <laughs> but Verse 16. No, what you see there was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its, in its grip. King David said this about him, I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you know, you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Notice when the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, the first thing he does is put the spotlight on Jesus. And that's where we can get sidetracked if we don't do that, if we don't operate that way. The Holy Spirit inspires Peter to take the scriptures. So the Holy Spirit always leads people to the word of God. And he, he takes the scriptures and he makes a beeline straight to the cross, exalting Jesus' death and resurrection. And as a result, 3,000 people come to faith from that one sermon. Some unusual things had happened that day, no doubt about it. But there was no doubt God was in charge. Now, some of you may still be saying, I just don't believe in that. But don't you wish you did? A.W. Tozer said that the spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It's the part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Whatever you do, and I don't know what your backgrounds may be, but don't ever let unbelief, fear, pride, or anything else keep you from everything God has for you. He, if you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. He loves you. And above all, never forget what made it all possible. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives.